My name is Red Torpy and I publish the Baltimore Sun. This uh, program is due to the perseverance of Joe Stern, who's the editorial page editor of the Sun. Uh, he decided on his own, without any prompting from other Georgians, that it would be a good idea to get Senator Nunn to come to uh, speak to this group. And he persevered and was able to do that. And then he convinced his publisher that it would be a good idea for him to go spend a month in Europe in preparation for <laughs> that introduction. <laughs> and if that convinces you that he has a naive publisher, that probably is true as well. I'm delighted to, uh, to uh, see that Baltimore has this kind of uh, a group that is interested in the kind of program that we're going to have this evening, and I'm delighted to present to you the editorial page editor of The Sun, Joe Stern, to present the speaker. Uh, everything my publisher says is always correct. Uh, I, I have spent a little time in Europe, and uh, let me tell you that our speaker tonight uh, got much bigger coverage in the European press than he did in the American press. And there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is this. First, he was over in Brussels and Warsaw and probably a few other places uh, giving a, uh, an American response to a lot of the rhetoric that came out of the Schultz visit to, to Moscow. And the Europeans respected this kind of response because I think they perceive that our speaker tonight is perhaps the most influential member of the United States Congress in the formulation of national security policy. He riled up the Europeans a few years ago with a proposal that uh, if Europe was not prepared to spend the money to bring its conventional forces up to par, uh, then the United States should not keep a uh, force of men committed to Europe out of proportion to, to the uh, capabilities uh, that they were providing. Uh, but he's not conceived, in my opinion, as another Mike Mansfield, because uh, Senator Mansfield uh, proposed pretty much a unilateral withdrawal of U.S. troops from Europe. I think Senator Nunn's proposal is far more conditional and far more uh, aimed not at weakening NATO but strengthening it. I think this also applies to what is the basis of its strength in the United States Congress because, in my opinion, he approaches the administration from its blind side, meaning that he doesn't attack it for spending too much, although he's done that. He attacks it more from the standpoint of whether its strategy uh, 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 meshes our goals with our capabilities. And uh, uh, he therefore appeals to those Americans who would like to have a more rational defense policy than we now have. Uh, our speaker, uh, Senator Sam Nunn, was elected to the United States Senate in 1972. Uh, he was appointed to the Senate Armed Services Committee where he has carried on a great Georgia tradition of leadership in the military field. He is today chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the distinguished senior senator from Georgia. senior senator from Georgia, the introductions are rather hazardous. I've been introduced now about 10 or 15 times as Georgia's senior citizen. <laughs> tells me something about the length of my tenure in the Senate these days. I'm delighted to have a chance to be here in Baltimore. I'm delighted to see my good friend, uh, Reg Murphy, to be introduced by Joe, who I contact and in contact with very frequently, and to speak and visit with this splendid audience. Reg didn't tell you about all the things that go back in the history of his background and mine, but he was editor of the Atlanta Constitution when I was running for the United States Senate back in 1972. 
And he was extremely helpful. I remember one of his comments. He said, uh, right at a crucial moment, if you took all of Sam Nunn's supporters and loaded them in a Volkswagen car, they could have a very comfortable tour of the state of Georgia. <laughs> it was those kind of tidbits that gave me so much confidence in my campaign. <laughs> but we do indeed value Reg Murphy. He was a superb editor in the state of Georgia, the Atlanta Constitution. He was a great citizen of our state. And we really feel that he's on loan here in Baltimore. We're not going to give him up permanently. And Reg, it's good to be with you. I'm delighted to have a chance to speak before dinner. I told uh, your chairman, Chairman Patterson and Frank Bird, that this kind of format is wonderful for a speaker because so many times you go to a particular forum and long reception, long dinner, long awards, and so forth, and the speaker gets up to speak finally when everyone is exhausted. So having this format is indeed a, a great uh, privilege for me. I'm also delighted to speak to an audience that uh, gets the coverage of the Baltimore Sun because you have two outstanding writers in the defense field. Charlie Poetry is, I think, the dean of the defense delegation in Washington, and Vernon Guidry is following closely in his footsteps. Charlie has uh, the knowledge and the background and the objectivity. Uh, his articles usually are, are right on point, and it's a pleasure to be in the uh, the defense arena when people like that occur in you. So I'm pleased to also be with an audience that reads and of course absorbs that kind of information. Speaking of prestigious audiences, I read a story supposedly true about a particular master who was the master of ceremonies one evening where General George Marshall was retiring for his last time. General Marshall having gone through all sorts of assignments important for this country. At the head table with uh, General Marshall were his wife, Miss Eisenhower, then General Eisenhower. Ambassador Joseph Grew was up introducing George Marshall. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this man has done everything an individual could ever do for his country. He has been head of the U.S. Army. He has been chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He has led our nation to a successful victory in World War II. He came back then and became Secretary of Defense, and then he became Secretary of State, and now he has finally retired from that job. So, ladies and gentlemen, this individual could have any office that the people of this country would have the power of bestowing if he simply asked for it. So, but he's too modest. All he wants to do is go down to his little farm in Virginia, and his lifetime dream is to retire there on that little farm and spend the rest of his life with Mrs. Eisenhower. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, everyone was embarrassed. The master was embarrassed. The whole head table was embarrassed. He had nothing to do but just finally sit down, and he did. And he, he knew he had to make amends somehow, so he wrote a little note to Mrs. Eisenhower and said, Dear Mrs. Eisenhower, my profound regrets. Please express these regrets to the general. <laughs> she was still fuming, and so she wrote a little note back and said, Which general? <laughs> so prestigious crowds sometimes have their own hazards. When we think about dreams, I suppose that if we were dreaming four or five years ago, six years ago, we would never dream we would be today where we are in terms of at least the possibilities in the arms control arena. And I know Joe has just toured Europe for a month. I've been over for about a week listening to the reactions, giving some of my own ideas, and trying to keep abreast of the developments in, in Moscow. I think that if you look at the developments in Moscow, they pose both opportunities and challenges for our NATO alliance, indeed for the entire free world. Because what we have now is the so-called INF proposal, Intermediate Nuclear Force proposal, that gives us at least the opportunity of reducing those weapons down to zero. That was the American proposal. General Secretary Gorbachev had a slight amendment to it. He has agreed now to a zero level of what we call INF missiles, at least in Europe. 
with 100 warheads reserved on both sides for some location outside Europe, with the Soviets having theirs in Asia and the United States having the right to have ours here in the United States. Of course, there are a lot of catches to this proposal. We still have to negotiate a verification regime that gives us the, us the confidence that with our own independent means, we will be able to make sure the agreement is complied with, and that is no easy task. We also have the question of short-range nuclear missiles. If we look at all the nuclear agenda, if you look at from one end to the other of the spectrum, you see that we start with strategic weapons and then we have intermediate weapons, strategic being those weapons that can be deployed in one of the superpowers' own territory and strike the territory of the other superpower. The intermediate weapons, though, are not that long-range. They vary from about a thousand and in terms of minimum mileage range to 3,000 miles. So that's what we call intermediate weapons. Then you go down to the short range weapons. And those weapons have now been defined by both sides as having a range of 300 to 600 miles. Below that are weapons that we're now not negotiating, and that is the tactical or battlefield weapons. So there's a whole array, a whole spectrum of nuclear weapons. And we're talking about right now two categories, the so-called intermediate weapons, and the so-called short-range weapons. Once it became clear that the United States and our allies were going to have a reasonable opportunity to make progress in the INF area, those in charge of the negotiations concluded that we had better highlight this short-range missile problem because the Soviet Union has 130 some odd short-range missiles that would be left in Europe unless we come to grips with those in this arrangement and the United States has zero short-range weapons. So what we did then, we proposed on our side that the short-range systems had to be dealt with in this INF negotiation. The Soviets at first resisted, and then they have come around to that point of view, and they've now said that, okay, zero is a good number for the INF missiles. Why don't we go to zero on the short-range systems? Instead of NATO building up short-range weapons, we'll go to zero within one year. Now that would never have been proposed, in my opinion, by previous Soviet leaders. It caught NATO by surprise, in effect, not necessarily last week, but in the last two or three weeks, there were a lot of people who felt that this was going to be the Soviet offer. Well, some people would say, well, what is then the problem? Why didn't NATO simply grab that? Why didn't Secretary Schultz simply grab it in Moscow? Well, one reason is because he had very wisely, I think, promised the Allies that before anything was agreed on in Moscow, on those short-range systems, or even on the overall INF, he would bring the proposal back and sit down and have a consultation with our NATO allies. And he has done that now. But they have not made a decision. And they are in a period, as Joe can easily tell you, having been in Germany recently, they are in a period of great consternation trying to determine what to do. Well, why the concern? Give you a little background. General Bernard Rogers, who heads up our NATO alliance, stated about a, two or three years ago, and he's repeated this several times, that if the Soviet Union invaded Western Europe with conventional, that is, non-nuclear forces, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, General Rogers, would have to request the early release of nuclear weapons. He went on to say that our conventional deficiencies are so great that we would have to, he would have to request at least, political leaders would make the decision, the release of nuclear weapons in a matter of, quote, days, not weeks, end quote. So that tells you something about the nervousness of people in Europe. It also tells you something about the profound dilemma that we in NATO have, because this is nothing new. We have depended on nuclear weapons to basically deter not only nuclear war, but also to deter conventional war since the end of World War II. The heart and soul of NATO defense and the deterrence posture of NATO for 35 years now has been based on responding with nuclear weapons to a conventional attack. Now that poses a severe dilemma because the European allies begin to see that perhaps they're on a slippery slope. In fact, General Secretary Gorbachev went further in some of his remarks in Moscow, and he said, now once we get rid of the INF missiles, once we get rid of the short-range missiles, 
we can then discuss going forward and getting rid of all the battlefield weapons. And the battlefield weapons on our side now number some four or five thousand weapons. So we've got a lot of nuclear weapons left, but they are the short range systems. They're the systems that range anywhere from 25 to 100 miles. Obviously, those are the systems that are the least stable systems because in a conventional attack across Europe, those systems would either have to be used at an early stage, and God forbid that that ever happened, or they would be lost, they would be overrun. Or in the alternative, we would spend a lot of conventional manpower moving those weapons back from the front line. So those are the weapons that I have always been most profoundly concerned about as the most destabilizing of systems. So the Europeans are now in a period, right, as we speak here this evening, and probably for the next several weeks, of going into considerable private consultations about what their response should be. Essentially, they have three choices. I say they, I should say we, because all of NATO is involved in this. One is they can accept that offer on INF and short-range systems and indeed go to zero on both of them. A second alternative, of course, is to reject the offer. But I would think at this stage of the negotiation that a rejection would carry with it a corresponding obligation to make a counteroffer. So let's call that option number three, a counteroffer. What would the counteroffer say? The counteroffer would have to say something like, okay, we will accept the equal number of short-range systems, but we're going to build up to a certain number instead of you building down to zero. Let's say the number is 75 or 100, wherever the alliance chooses. Now that's not going to be an easy proposition to sell in Europe. And I think that implicitly, if the Allies decide to move in that direction, what they're implying is that they want the United States to build a short-range missile, because we're the ones who build those weapons, and that they not only want us to build one, but they're going to go to their citizens and say, we want to deploy that short-range system. So you can begin to get the dilemma that NATO allies find themselves in. A long-time dependence on nuclear weapons, not only that, a long-time dependence on the early use of nuclear weapons. Now you have a Soviet leader who is essentially saying he's prepared under the right conditions to denuclearize Europe. Where does that leave NATO? A lot of our allies believe it leaves them on a very slippery slope because the conventional advantages of the Soviet Union, in their view, would be overwhelming. Now let's suppose the NATO allies say, let's make this counteroffer and let's go to 100. They're going to have to get out in their public and they're going to have to sell that and they're going to have to explain to their people why it is when we're going to zero on INF and the Soviets are offering to go to zero on short range systems, the allies are saying, no, we don't want them to go to zero, at least we want to be able to go up to 100 weapons. Now that is, is a difficult sales job. Let's assume another proposition. Let's assume the Allies basically come back and say, okay, we want to stop at 100, we want to have equal numbers at 100, we're going to build up to 100, and the Soviets say, okay, we agree to that. Now let's assume our Allies decide, oh, we really don't want to do that now. We really don't want to do that. We think it's too tough politically. We think that the, the United States should not build those systems, or if they build them, we reserve the right not to deploy them. Well now, from a United States point of view, I find that unacceptable. I'm not going to vote to build 100 weapon systems that the Allies have not agreed in advance and told their own people in advance that they're willing to deploy. And I think most people in Congress would probably feel the same way. So they're going to have to then confront the dilemma of what kind of position would they be in if implicitly they say we're willing to go to 100 but then they're not willing to go further and say, we're going to deploy that hunter. That would be a very curious proposition because they would be saying to the Soviet Union, in effect, no, we, won't, we don't want you to go down to zero in short range systems because we don't want to be bound to go to zero in short range systems, but guess what? We're not going to really deploy those short range systems. And then the circle has closed because then what they've said to the Soviets, you keep your systems and we'll stay at zero. Now that is the dilemma they face. 
I say they because I think this affects Europe politically because it's more sensitive in Europe politically than it is here. But it would get pretty sensitive here. On the other hand, the Europeans decided they wanted us to build a system that they weren't willing to deploy. And I don't think that would be accepted. Well, Winston Churchill, as he did in so many other areas, anticipated our overall problems back a number of years ago. One of the last speeches he made to the United States Congress, I believe it was the last speech, he said the following, quoting him, be careful above all things not to let go of atomic weapons until you're sure and more than sure that other means of preserving the peace are in your hands. I think it's time for us to really seriously ask ourselves in NATO, what other means of preserving the peace are in our hands? How long are we going to continue to be dependent not only on nuclear weapons to deter a nuclear war, which I think will be a long, long time in the future, but also dependent on nuclear weapons to deter non-nuclear war? How long will NATO continue in that posture? NATO's challenge, it seems to me, is, uh, is threefold. First of all, there's a growing allergy to nuclear weapons for very understandable reasons, both in this country and in Europe. And there is also, as people find out about it, a growing skepticism about NATO's policy not only to use nuclear weapons, but to use them early in a conflict because NATO has so many conventional deficiencies. Second, in addition to that challenge, NATO has no revolutionary, and I emphasize the word revolutionary, no revolutionary changes planned in force posture that would allow it to compensate for conventional deficiencies now. Couple that with NATO does not have on the table or even formulated any conventional arms control proposals that would eliminate the deficiencies and ease the serious challenge the Soviets posed with their very, very large tank armies in Europe. And third, we now face a very skillful and a very articulate and a very public relations minded Soviet leader for the first time in many, many years. Gorbachev, whatever his long run intentions may be, and none of us, I believe, are capable of defining those now, we have to acknowledge he's a different kind of Soviet leader. Whatever his motives, he is basically upping the ante and calling NATO's bet. In fact, he's raising the bet. So this is the combination. Increased allergy to nuclear weapons. No force posture or arms control proposals on the NATO side that would combine to eliminate the weaknesses in the conventional arms. Combined with a smart, skillful, articulate Soviet leader who has call the bet, in fact, raise the bet. That's what NATO faces. What then is the response? Well, I don't think there's any one formula for the response, but I have a few ideas I'd like to just share with you this evening. The first thing that I would suggest is that in the INF agreement, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement, that we have a standard, what is a standard clause in most arms control agreements that says that if the supreme national interest is threatened, we have the right to abrogate the agreement. Now that's in the ABM, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty that was entered into in 1972. It's in most arms control agreements. The second thing I would advise in connection with that is not to join conventional proposals or chemical proposals into this one agreement. Not to formally do that because they aren't far enough along and it would make this negotiation stretch forever. But I do believe that we ought to psychologically connect the INF agreement with conventional and chemical arms control proposals which will be forthcoming. <laughs> By psychologically connect, what I mean is we ought to say and serve notice, and it's got to be done openly and publicly and notoriously so our public will understand it, that okay, we're going to reduce these INF missiles. We're going to find a formula for producing short-range systems. But we don't have any leverage on short-range systems because we don't have any of them. And therefore, before we complete the withdrawal of the intermediate systems, which would take over a five-year period under the current proposal, before we get down to the last 20-25% of them, we're going to take a careful look at how we stand with the Soviet Union in conventional arms and how we stand in chemical arms. 
That means that we are making a, an all-important connection psychologically with conventional and chemical weapons and nuclear weapons, a connection that has not been made in the public mind of this country or in the public mind of Europe for a long, long period of time. The second major proposal that I would make would really be a three-track approach for NATO. NATO had a successful two-track approach when we decided we were going to pursue arms control and we were also going to deploy those I and F systems. If we had not pursued arms control, we would have never had them deployed because public opinion would not have tolerated it. If we had not deployed them, we would have never had arms control because the Soviet Union does not usually engage in philanthropy. So that two-track system worked, and it worked because we had two presidents, not one, Carter and Reagan, that had a continuous foreign policy in that area. And we had courageous European political leaders who went to the bat with their own people when so many people opposed it in Europe. So what I'm proposing tonight is a three-track approach. That would consist of, first, a vigorous educational effort, which has been lacking too long in NATO. Second, revolutionary conventional force improvements to improve our force posture in Europe. And I say in Europe, I mean all of us have to do it. It won't help the United States to do it alone. We've got to have things that we're willing to do and going to do in the absence of arms control that would dramatically improve our conventional capability in Europe. And third, bold and innovative arms control proposals. And I think that third one and the second one and the first one all have to go together. Now, on the educational track, very briefly, we've got to connect in the public mind the connection between our reliance on nuclear weapons and the deficiencies on the conventional scale. We've got to connect the overwhelming advantage the Soviets have in tanks with our nuclear weapons, which were introduced in Europe in the battlefield systems in the first place to prevent the Soviet Union from congregating or massing those tanks, putting them in a position to launch a blitzkrieg attack. If they know we have battlefield weapons, they know that if tanks are vulnerable if massed, they change their whole formations and their battle strategy when those weapons are introduced. If you remove those weapons, the Soviet tank forces, as awesome as they are now, become even more awesome because they can then congregate them without worrying that they will be exposed and vulnerable. So that kind of educational effort is very important. On the second track, conventional force improvements, I will cut this short on each one of them, but suffice it to say that there are some automatic escalators that we've got to cure. By automatic escalators, I mean deficiencies in the conventional force posture that mean we've got to go to the early use of nuclear weapons. And once you start using nuclear weapons, no one knows what's going to happen then. You can draw the battlefield plans you want to. No one can tell you that you're going to continue on a slight escalation. When you get on that escalator on the nuclear side and it starts heading up, then that escalator may be very hard to get off of. And it's certainly going to be very hard to stop. So we've got to cure these conventional deficiencies. One deficiency is the ammunition supply. This was a subject of the amendment that Joe mentioned a few minutes ago, 1985, which failed, but I think it sent a lot of messages to Europe. The European allies give out ammunition in Europe about the time our forces that we pay for over here arrive on the shores of Europe. And when the European allies give out ammunition, the conventional side of the war is over. At that stage, you either run up the white flag or surrender, or you go to nuclear weapons, neither of which is an acceptable choice. So they've got to get up to the NATO 30-day ammunition supply. A second escalator that's automatic is that we spend about 50 to 60 billion dollars, or have spent that much over the last five or six years, on a modern air force. Now, most of those planes stay in the United States. We made an agreement back in the Carter administration, 78, 79, that the European allies would build aircraft shelters so that if there was a war in Europe, when those planes flew over, they'd have a place to be sheltered so they could be protected, and they'd have a place to refuel, and they would have minimum essential facilities for maintenance. Guess what? The allies didn't build them. So we've been sitting here for a number of years, having spent a lot of money, and if we had a war tomorrow morning, when those planes flew over there, they would have time to fly one time. 
And then they would get on the ground and they'd either be blown up or they'd find they couldn't fly anymore because they didn't have any fuel, nowhere to get fuel. Now that doesn't mean the planes that are over there, but this means the relief planes that would be going over. So that was the subject of the amendment in 1985, telling our allies they had to do their part. If they didn't do their part, then we could not have a viable conventional defense. And if we don't have a viable conventional defense, then the number of forces we have over there is not that important because the forces that are there will simply be ringing the nuclear bell, as they say in Europe. That's what we call a limited tripwire. And I don't think that's an acceptable policy for NATO. Nevertheless, we've got to curb those automatic escalators. That's part of track two. A second part of track two, again, this is the subject of a separate speech, which I won't go into tonight, structural disarmament. The fact that we all, as sovereign, independent nations in NATO, insist on building our own weapon system of every type. We have something like 11 or 12 anti-tank weapons being built in seven countries. Lloyd Carrington summarized it well when he said that the only thing NATO allies have in common is the air and the tires of the jeeps. <laughs> now that's why it costs so much. NATO outspends the Warsaw Pact every year. We have for the last 25 years. Now, that doesn't mean the United States outspends Russia. We, we don't do that. But the, collectively, the NATO alliance outspends the Warsaw Pact. But because we are independent, because each of our military services in each country decide they're going to have their own weapon systems, we simply are not getting our dollars worth collectively. And we get outproduced each and every year by the Warsaw Pact, a totalitarian system that supposedly does not have much efficiency in their overall industry. But in the defense industry, they outstrip us every year. The third part of track two is technology. We do have an advantage in technology. And I'll make it short and simple on this one. We need to have a declared goal in our technological research to render tanks obsolete. To render tanks obsolete. That is an achievable goal in my view, but it will take an all-out dedicated effort. And if you could render tanks obsolete, you would do as much to change the balance of power in the world, and you would do as much for world peace, in my opinion, if not more, than you would if you rendered missiles obsolete. Because the Soviet tank forces in Europe are the most destabilizing part of the overall equation. The third track is arms control. We need to come up with bold and innovative arms control proposals. What kind of proposals? Well, General Secretary Gorbachev, according to the news reports, asked Secretary Schultz, what are you afraid of when he was talking about reducing the zero? What are you afraid of? I think a very quick response to the General Secretary would be, we're afraid of the Warsaw Pact tanks. You've got 50,000 of them, and we've got 12,000. We're afraid of the Warsaw Pact artillery tubes. You've got 40,000 of them, and we have 10,000. We're afraid of the Warsaw Pact anti-tank weapons. You have 30,000, and we have 10,000. We're afraid of the Warsaw Pact attack helicopters. You have 1,000, and we have 500. We're afraid of your 175 divisions of military forces when we have 80. That's what we're afraid of. But the problem was NATO wasn't ready to say what we were going to do about it. We didn't have any armed control proposals in mind. We've been bogged down in a procedural kind of debate at NATO, trying to come up with even a procedure to respond to the Soviet Union's conventional proposal. They've made a conventional proposal, even though they have the overwhelming advantage. What kind of substance would we be talking about with a conventional proposal? The goal should be, and there'll be a lot of formulations of this goal and ways to implement it, but the goal should be to effectively deny the Soviet Union's ability to threaten NATO with its overwhelming conventional offensive capability, to do away with the possibility or the danger of a short warning attack. If you do away with that kind of short warning attack, you stabilize the situation and you bring to bear the resources that NATO could muster over a long period of time. Now, what kind of proposal would this be? I threw out in Belgium last week a proposal that would be asymmetrical, meaning it would be disproportionate. We cannot reduce equally with the Soviets. If we do, we'll end up with zero, and they'll end up with an overwhelming advantage. So it has to be disproportionate. It has to be what we call asymmetrical. 
What I threw out was a 13 division reduction by the Soviets, not just manpower. A manpower measure is outmoded if it's not taken with equipment. Tanks, artillery tubes, all of it. If they pull 13 divisions out of Eastern Europe, I think a fair return if you pull out by the United States would be two divisions. 13 divisions to two. Now the second part of that equation is that when you get down to where those divisions are going to go, they've got to be able to be brought back in in equal time. If we bring ours all the way across the ocean and they pull theirs into the western military districts of the Soviet Union, you still have a terribly disproportionate balance of power in Europe and a very destabilizing situation. So the equal time to return is an important part of that. Well, what's in it for the Soviet Union? Who knows about where the Soviet leaders are going with that country now? But I think one thing that the Soviet leaders hopefully will begin to realize is that the more they threaten their neighbors, the more danger they're in themselves. We're not in a period that we were in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. We're in a period where we have nuclear proliferation around the world and we have terrorist groups. And some of those terrorist groups would like nothing better than to start a war between the two superpowers. So both superpowers have a mutual interest in reducing the risk of war at every level. That's what's in it for the Soviet Union. And they could dramatically reduce the risk of war and they could dramatically increase their own security by lessening the threat they have on their neighbors. The second thing that's in it for the Soviet Union would be economic. We spend most of our time talking about nuclear weapons, but the big dollars are in conventional weapons. That's where the manpower is. That's where the equipment is. That's where the expenditures are. So if the Soviets really want to do something about revitalizing their economy, nothing could be more helpful than reducing approximately 13 divisions in Europe. When we talk about zero INF, when we talk about zero short-range missiles, the United States and our allies should add another zero proposal to the calendar, and that is zero tanks. Then we will really be talking about comprehensive arms control. Then we will really be talking about bringing about a much better chance for world peace. General George Marshall, one statement that if man does find the solution to world peace, it will be the most revolutionary development in the history of the world. In a nuclear age, in an age of proliferation of nuclear weapons and terrorism, our challenge is clear, but it is awesome. We must reverse the record of history. Thank you very much.
than our ability to successfully defend Europe, even with all the improvements I've talked about this evening, would not be uh, available. So the Navy of the United States has to keep the sea lanes open. The Soviet Navy has a much easier task, that is to close the sea lanes. It's a lot easier to close them than it is to keep them open. So we have to have a superiority in maritime forces, and I think we still retain that. We have to make tough decisions, though, now. We have to make a decision this year about whether to have two new carriers. A carrier now is about $3 billion, but by the time you add the airplanes on the carrier, it gets up to $7 billion. And unless the carrier has airplanes, it's not going to be able to function at sea. The carrier also has to have a ship uh, contingent of, of other service ships for its own protection. If you add all those in, you get up to a carrier task force being about $18 billion. So we're making two decisions this year, and that's what a lot of times uh, gets Congress and all of us in trouble. We're making two decisions on two new carriers that carry with the, the implications of $18 billion in outlay over the next six or seven years. Now, the real question is not whether we need carriers, in my view. The question is whether that's the best place to spend the money, or should we put that money in, let's say, attack submarines? Should we go underwater with our uh, Navy more and more? Those are the kind of crucial questions we'll have this year, but we do need to continue a very strong U.S. Navy. And I must say that the Naval Academy here in Maryland plays a very critical role in that. Mr. Palmer. Senator, <clears throat> with the kind of uh, views that you've expressed this evening, a presidential candidate, not necessarily yourself, supposing he adopted those views, how would he sell with the public in 1988 elections, presidential elections? Well, if you've had a, a, a chance to address an American public like this, that is in a forum where you can go through the whole array and go through the whole connection between conventional and nuclear weapons, I think that kind of message would be understood and received. The problem is when it is summarized and someone comes out with a, a very short summary of what someone said about, let's say, the dangers of complete reduction to zero nuclear weapons, things can get pretty badly distorted. But nevertheless, uh, most of the presidential candidates that I have observed understand this on both sides, and I think that we will have a responsible discussion. In the past, when you have, for instance, major weapon systems become enmeshed in a campaign, it has not been a good experience for the country. I think that, for instance, the B-1 became an issue in 1976. President Carter, or then Governor Carter running, said he would counsel the B-1 weapon system. And he did. When President Reagan came in, that was a major issue. He said he was going to restore that B-1 because President Carter counseled it and it was a mistake. When he came in, he did restore it. The problem, as I see it from my point of view, when Carter counseled it, it should have been built. By the time Reagan built it, it should have been counseled. <laughs> So I, I'm, aware, I'm aware of the dangers of presidential campaign. The MX basing mode is another example of that. Because it got enmeshed in the 80 campaign. The president said he wasn't going to base the MX in some of the western states. It was very popular in those states. He came in, he changed the basing mode. Five years later, we still have the same land-based vulnerability that we had. We have not done anything to really improve that, although we've improved our overall posture. We have not cured the problem that the MX was based uh, on. And, and so that, that's the kind of trouble you can get in in campaigns. But I believe that these issues have to be discussed because in democracies, our only uh, hope for long-term survival, survival is that the citizens of our country will be able to tackle and understand complex issues and hold candidates responsible for discussing things, not in bumper sticker fashion, but rather in enough detail so that it is credible and meaningful. Yes, sir. Senator Nunn, uh, could you address two subjects? Number one, uh, do you think the military will be able to fulfill its manpower requirements, let's say within the next decade, uh, without a draft? And secondly, could you uh, address, albeit briefly, uh, some of the intent behind the Military Reform Act of 1986? Yes, on the, on the manpower question, I'm, I am not representative of a majority opinion on this one. I have a minority view because I think abolishing the draft was a, a, a fundamental error. And I believe that uh, the problem back in the Vietnam days was not the draft. The problem was the war we were in, the foreign policy we were conducting, and the fact that the draft was not uh, equitable. The 
fact that people in higher income brackets were generally able to get away from it and people in lower brackets were not. So I think that was a problem, but the, the cure has been the volunteer force and it has worked well if you if you look at it as a peacetime mechanism for recruiting high quality manpower. I think it has succeeded in doing that, particularly in the last six or seven years because we have beefed up both benefits and pay. Now the real question is whether we can in peacetime continue with that kind of pay and benefit structure or whether we're going to see the budget squeeze begin to erode some of that. If it begins to erode it, we're going to begin to see a quality deterioration, and I hope that does not happen. In wartime, we'd have to go back to the draft just like that. Even a Vietnam-style war, that limited-type war, would require a draft, and everybody knows that that's looked at these questions, but our American young people don't know it. They believe if we have a war, that we're not going to have a draft. So what we've got is a peacetime mechanism. It is not something that could sustain a war. In terms of how long it will be able to continue, I don't see any move to change it now. I believe that if you are going to change it, it has to be addressed through some form of national service proposal. And I believe that national service would have to be much broader than simply the military, but would really encompass the overall needs of uh, young people and the role they can play in our society. I think the long-term danger of a, not of a volunteer force is the fact it begins over a period of time to separate those making critical decisions in government from the military in the sense that 10 or 15 years from now, if you look at the Congress, we'll probably have 75 to 90 percent who've never served one day in the military. If you look at the executive branch, State Department, Defense Department, civilians, White House, you will find that people that have uh, never served in the military, I think, will fundamentally be making different kinds of decisions about the use of that military. So I do not consider the uh, absence of a draft to be uh, a less dangerous kind of situation for our country. I think over the long haul it will become a dangerous factor in civilian decision making. Mr. Shapiro. Senator, one of the uh, serious economic problems we have in this country is our trade imbalance. Yet we seem to have a conflict with respect to how much we're going to let the Soviet Union have with, uh, with regard to technology. Uh, how do you feel about loosening up on the exports of technology, which seems to be much of the press today? Well, I think we've got a mess on our hands now. I think that we've got technology that is essentially being sold by other allies around the world that has uh, not been able to be exported by American businesses. I wouldn't use the term loosening up. What I would use is, is basically reducing the list of what we protect to essential items and then tightening up in protection of those. I think the problem now is we're trying to protect so much that we've lost the credibility of, to some extent, our allies who have to cooperate because we only produce in America now something like 30, 35% of new technology. Eight, 10 years ago, we were producing 75 or 80%. So we could act like we had a monopoly. Today, uh, an awful lot of the new technology is coming from both Japan and Europe. So unless we have the cooperation of our allies and that confidence, you simply aren't going to be able to protect the technology. And second, and most important, we've got to have the confidence of the American business community. Because everyone visions new technology, and I must say I'm, I'm not completely abreast of all the new breakthroughs myself, as having as something that the custom service can break and break open in a port like Baltimore and look in the package and find that we're shipping new technology. That's really not the most valuable kind of technology. Most of it would be contained in someone's mind and almost you could put it on a, a little microchip. And so those, those kinds of things can only be protected in the final analysis by the confidence and cooperation of the business community in this country and our allies. So we have to cut down the number of things we're protecting and do a heck of a lot better job of protecting that that's left. At the microphone here. Senator Dunn, um, five weeks ago you gave a marathon speech for the literature Senate that uh, rendered the Reagan administration's broad interpretation of the ADM treaty well infinite and obsolete. Um, what is the future of SDI? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the way I approached that was strictly on a legal basis. I went back and looked at the negotiating record. I studied what the Senate of the United States was told. And of course, the Constitution of the United States says that when a treaty is ratified and the articles of ratification delivered to the other um, party to the treaty that it then becomes the law of the land. So to me the question is not what becomes of SDI. The question is what is the law of the land? And I do not believe we ought to be manipulating 
what I think is the sacred law of the land, if, if my interpretation is correct, for the purpose of giving us a few more tests than SDI. Uh, if we want, if we come to the stage where we think SDI has to have tests that uh, are not permitted by the traditional interpretation, in my view, we ought to take a look at the abrogation clause, which is that supreme national interest clause that says give six months notice and you can terminate the treaty. I think it would be foolish to do that now because I don't think we have any tests that are going to be impinged on in the next couple of years by the traditional interpretation. They're scrambling around over the Pentagon now trying to find some tests that uh, would be impacted by the traditional, and I'll be shocked if they don't find it. That's because they've been given a directive, in my view, an implicit directive, to go find some tests that would, that would be uh, uh, impinged by this. So I think we ought to really approach the ABM debate about what really was said, what kind of negotiation we had with the Soviets, what was the understanding of the parties. Uh, it seems to me that if we have any hope in the future of having enforceable agreements on both sides in arms control that we ourselves have to be willing to abide by the spirit and the letter of those agreements. And then we also need to, of course, call their hand if they violate, which we must do. And if we feel that the Supreme National Interest dictates, if we don't get an arms control agreement, if SDI is being impinged on to the point we can't test crucial technology, and if we feel that that's that the case, then we ought to go with the abrogation clause. Mr. Trump. Mr. President, I'm sorry, I mean, Senator Nunn, we were uh, constituents of yours in Atlanta for seven years. Uh, I remember you all come back now, yeah? Uh, Senator Nunn, um, in this private moment with you, uh, uh, would you uh, consider commenting on uh, the possibility that uh, you could play a, a highest purpose role in our country for America and for the world, uh, either by remaining in the position that you have now and the chairmanship you have, or by being a candidate for President of the United States, or should a, a Democratic administration uh, get in in 88, be something like Secretary of Defense. Uh, before you answer, I kind of like in the moment that you are in history to where Harry Truman was, but I hope you don't go for Vice President. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we can give an off-the-record kind of uh, candidate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the camera wouldn't use that. Now, I, I made the decision back in February. I had a good many people urging me to, to run. Uh, I think we could have filled up two Volkswagens with the people who would <laughs> take a comfortable trip. Uh, I decided that there wasn't any way in the world I could get out and be a candidate and go through the Iowa and New Hampshire primaries and the things going leading up to that and also handle the defense responsibilities that were my responsibility under the new chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee. I thought that if I was out in Iowa and having just been uh, made chairman of the Armed Services Committee, trying to campaign that that would simply uh, result in me being a poor chairman of the Armed Services Committee and also a poor candidate for president. So I decided to, to essentially defer any decision until what the experts will probably say is too late, and that is sometime in July, August. The other responsibility I've got is the Iranian Select Committee. I didn't seek that job, but Senator Byrd wanted me to serve on it. We're going to be extremely busy in May and June of this year, and I also felt it was simply not uh, compatible with that duty to be out uh, running for president. So I'm going to keep the window open until, say, July, August, that time frame, realizing that those who will likely be uh, successful will be those who started a long time ago. But you know, there's something really wrong with the presidential selection process when you have to be unemployed to run. <laughs> That's about where we are now. But I appreciate your kind of words. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator and I, I think you've done a very good job at explaining the problem we had in arms control and national defense. I even understood part of it myself. Uh, there's one thing I'm not too clear on. Uh, I think you were saying that we're taking care of the, national, of the uh, nuclear arms side of this, but we have a big problem in the conventional arms. Very great imbalance between us and the other side. Uh, and that we are going to have to, until the utopian period comes when we uh, make tanks obsolete, we're going to have to upgrade our conventional arms side of our national defense. 
Uh, in answer to our previous question, you mentioned the, the role of the Navy in Navy keeping the sea lanes clear so the material, as in World War II, could run back and forth between our country and the, uh, wherever the field of battle is. Now, all of this requires an industrial base, it seems to me. And over the past several years, our industrial base has eroded. And I'm wondering if you're concerned uh, if this so-called change from a smokestack manufacturing economy that we had previously, what if you're concerned that that would be able to, in effect, uh, support a conventional uh, military, especially during a period of war, uh, rather than have us in a, an economy which is a service-oriented paper shopping economy? Well, I, I am concerned about that. We, in fact, we formed a new subcommittee this year called the Defense Industry and Technology Subcommittee to focus on exactly the kind of problems you're talking about. We are becoming not only in our overall trade patterns and our commercial practices more and more dependent on foreign imports, we're also moving into that arena in defense. The microchip industry, which is the very heart and soul of most of our sophisticated technology today in defense, more and more we're having to import microchips. We've seen a recent uh, dispute between the United States and Japan on that. We and the committee now are contemplating a defense proposal which would essentially put about $50 million into an uh, overall organized effort to rebuild the uh, U.S. microchip industry. Uh, whether that will pass or not, I don't know, but we're in the middle of considering that. Another thing we're considering is a proposal that I believe Senator Bingaman will make to put about $100 million this year into improving the technology base in defense. That is, using technology to improve production efficiency. Strangely enough, we don't seem to have an incentive system in the defense bill or in the defense uh, procurement system to give industries the same kind of incentive in defense manufacturing that they do in commercial manufacturing to improve productivity. Now, some of that is because the defense the department and the U.S. government own a lot of the facilities and own a lot of the tooling. And so the defense industry uh, is usually an effect of a lessee in that regard. The idea here would be able to put certain money into uh, the defense research arena so that we could begin improving our manufacturing capability and productivity. It is a serious problem. I touched on it a few minutes ago when I said that we were basically going through structural disarmament because the NATO allies all have their own Army, Navy, Air Force, which is understandable, they have continued. They all have their own procurement system, and all of us in NATO reinvent the wheel. We're trying to begin to do something about that. We passed a bill about a year and a half ago that is now being implemented, beginning to give, we put a pot of $200 million in the, in the kitty and said we want this to be used only for joint research projects with our allies. The idea being if you start researching a weapon together, you'll end up procuring it together and get rid of some of this terrible inefficiency in production line. People concentrate on the waste in coffee pots, hammers, and those kind of things, and that's inexcusable, and it should not be tolerated. But the big waste is not in that area. The big waste is in inefficient production lines. We are not producing enough of any one system to be able to make it efficient. We are averaging in our major weapon systems about a 50% efficiency in production. And by that I mean we're spending the overhead, the tooling, the engineering, the manufacturing facilities to produce, let's say, 100 units a year, but we've got so many different systems that we're producing about an average of 50 units per year. Now about one third of every system is overhead. So we are producing and using a very inefficient direction in that regard. That's part of the manufacturing problem is the unit costs go up because they don't have enough production of uh, units per system. So all of those things have to be addressed, and you're exactly right that our industrial base has been the basic part of our defense for a long time, and we must continue. Do you think we have a steel industry that can support a conventional war now? Not a long-term World War II type war, no. But I don't think the goal is to go to a wall, even an industrial base for a World War II type war. I think the only conceivable circumstance that that would occur in would be something with the Soviet Union and in my opinion, the NATO goal of 30 days, if we can ever get our allies to come up to that, would be uh, the goal that we ought to aim for. When, when, you, when you can't get to 30 days, you surely can't get to uh, two or three years. So you've got to put, put in sync what we're really trying to do. And where our industrial capacity would be so important would be if we got into a non-U.S. Soviet war. And that kind of
have a situation of another Vietnam or another Korea, we do need a better steel industry than we've got today. But we also would have to say we need to count on our allies for some of that production. So I don't think our goal in the industrial base should be to go back to a World War II type capacity. I think that's unachievable, essentially. But we do need to do much better than we're doing now. Yes, the microphone. Senator Dunn, I have tried to keep a track of your record in voting, and it has been outstanding in comparison to a lot of the senators from Maryland and other states. The part that I would like to ask you is, you were talking about Europe and the amount of money that they spend on defense. Yet the Japanese only spend 1% of their gross. Why is it more pressure either put up or shut up and we'll take our people out and you'll defend yourself? The other thing is we're importing the jeeps into our army from Japan, our handguns for our military from Italy, and our machine guns from Belgium. I do not see how that builds strength for our country. Well, on that latter point, and, and that's a good point, but we also have to recognize that in a two-way street of, of trade, we've got to buy from our allies so they will buy from us. And when they've got a better machine gun or a better tank, we ought to be buying a better machine gun or tank. In exchange, we ought to be selling to them our airplanes and other things where we have an advantage. If we don't do this, we go down this road of structural disarmament. Because none of us as allies can produce enough of any one system on simply producing it for our own forces to be able to make it efficient. So we've got to have this kind of cross-purchasing. Indeed, we're trying to encourage that cross-purchasing. But we're trying to do it on an international basis so that we all compete and we indeed pick the best machine gun, the best tank, and the best airplanes. And then you have 14 countries buying that particular machine gun instead of one country. The other thing is that we're not going to fight a war. Uh, against uh, the Soviet Union and next door to our own country. If we're fighting, we're going to fight with allies. And if you've got every ally having a different machine gun, and every ally having a different tank, and every ally having a different piece of equipment, in addition to the monumental waste, you also cannot exchange crucial ammunition and crucial supplies on the battlefield. And of course, that is the ultimate inefficiency, and that ends up being a losing battle. On the question of Japan and their contribution, you're exactly right. They are not only spending about 1%, I think they finally crossed over the one this year, barely. They're spending about 1% of that GNP on defense, but if you add all of the international contributions to the international organizations, foreign aid and so forth, it's less than 2%. If you take our contributions and our defense, we're about 7%. Now that's just intolerable. The question is what we do about it. The Japanese Prime Minister said a few years ago that their defense goal was to protect the sea lanes and the air lanes a thousand miles from Japan. That's a good goal. The problem is they haven't implemented it. And we're having to use a lot of our maritime Navy forces to be able to protect those sea lanes. So we need to hold them to their own promise. Now what we don't want to do with the Japanese is encourage them, for instance, to go out and build aircraft carriers. If they did that, there a lot of people getting nervous, including some probably in their wife. So I mean, I, I don't think we want to go that way. But what we do want to do is get the Japanese to do a lot more in international organizations. We ought to really be putting a tremendous amount of pressure on them to help in the third world debt problem. I'd like to see the Japanese go to 4% of their GNP total, including the international commitments. But an awful lot of that, I think, ought to go into one of the most crucial national security problems we have now, and that's third world debt. What we're doing is setting up the next set of defense challenges four, five, six years from now, in a lot of these countries that are being squeezed because they can't pay their debt and they're being put in a situation where democracy almost can't survive. I was just in uh, Romania, an Eastern European country, and somehow they have a president who is obsessed with paying back the debt. He is doing to his people what eventually will happen to a lot of these other third world countries if we keep squeezing them as hard as they are being squeezed now. He's putting his people through the absolute arena. They've got malnutrition in Romania, which is one of the countries that has historically been a breadbasket for Europe. So we aren't going to be able to do that. And the thing that came across so vividly to me, visiting that country a very brief time, was the fact that only a totalitarian system could impose that kind of hardship on its people, 
only a totalitarian system. A lot of these countries are budding democracies that have this debt. Now, I'm not excusing them for getting in that situation, but we've got to recognize that the whole balance economically and uh, militarily over the long term may depend on whether we help them get out of it. And when I say we, back to Japan. The Japanese should be called on to spend, I think, 4 or 5% of their gross national product and probably at least 2% of it ought to go into international organizations to help with this third world debt problem. And I say international organizations because if you bet the Japanese, they'll strictly go bilateral with their aid and they'll tie it strictly to trade and the trade problems will get worse rather than better. So that's what I would say we need to do with Japanese. But your premise is entirely correct in, in the center of the For one reason, because the Soviets have a, uh, overwhelming numbers of tactical weapons themselves. When we introduced those tactical weapons in Europe, it was for exactly what you said. We didn't, we, at that stage, we were concerned because we had had a monopoly on nuclear power during the 50s. We started being vulnerable to a Soviet strike in the 60s. We decided we we're going to do that. We better put tactical nuclear weapons in so that uh, the first nuclear response would not be a strategic response against their homeland in response to a conventional attack. Then they started responding with battlefield nuclear weapons, and we're now in a situation where if we use tactical nuclear weapons, which is the NATO policy, we know that they're going to respond with them, and we basically don't gain anything militarily. So it is becoming, I'm not saying it's not credible, because we still have some credibility left with the, the first use possible doctrine, and some credibility is important in deterrence, but it is becoming less credible. It is like the old Marx Brothers cartoon where the, one of the Marx Brothers is standing over by a big ledge about to jump out of the window and the thugs are coming across threatening him and he puts a gun to his temple, one step closer and I'll pull the trigger. <laughs> that's, that's the nuclear response now. So our policy has got to be to try to prevent uh, nuclear escalation and that means a credible conventional defense. And let me give you a little bit of a rosier situation because people, I don't think we should be depressed about it where we are today. We just have a lot of challenges. The Soviets have Tremendous challenges they own. One is they got an economy which is simply not moving. They have an economy that's not compatible with the information age. They have a defense budget that's not compatible with a healthy economy. They're one of the few countries in the world that are surrounded primarily by unfriendly communist nations. Think about that one. <laughs> they don't have Mexico and Canada and those countries. They've got countries that really don't like them. They've got a third of their forces out on the Chinese border. They've got only one rail line connecting those forces. And one of the things that I've pushed for a long time is the ability of conventional forces to intercept that rail line, which would mean in the event of a Soviet attack on Europe or the Middle East, our capability would say to them, if you do that, we're going to isolate your forces in the Middle East, I mean in the Far East, and you're going to be at the tender mercies of your good friends, the Chinese. <laughs> That's deterrence. <laughs> so they've got big problems. They've also got to worry about transportation across Poland. I mean, any Soviet general going in to report the Politburo, they were asked what the Polish people are going to do in the event they get bogged down in a war on the Western Front. They're going to say, oh, we don't know what the Polish people and even the Polish army are going to do. So I don't think we have to have the ability to fight World War II over again to have deterrence at the conventional level. I think we need the ability to fight and fight well for NATO's goal, 30 days. I think the Soviet Union would, would, will not intentionally start a war that they think is going to last a long time because that empire could start crumbling. The day they get bogged down at the front, the day they have to worry about the Chinese, the Poles, <coughs> even the East Germans. So I think that's, that's real. Senator Nunn, we've imposed on you for a, a long time this evening. It's been good of you to share so much of your time with us. The, uh, your reputation has been uh, amply demonstrated by your comments this evening. Uh, I think the audience is uh, not only thankful to you for your time, uh, which you've shared so nicely with us, but is also reassured 
by the high seriousness and quality of the representation that you bring to some very, very serious areas uh, which are urgent concern to all of us. So on behalf of the audience, members of the council and trustees, we thank you very much.